hungry, or do we all share one, the one slice of the pie? And I know that for the comedy store, um, you know, uh, those strategic partnerships have become extremely important. Uh, we do not have uh, regular competition per se. Uh, our relationship with the improv down the street is fantastic. Uh, I know that we'll, we'll be performing uh, as the comedy store, with comedy store comics, here in Austin at Cap City. Um, and uh, for us, the, the comedy community and our placement within it and contextualizing ourselves within that has become more important. And then also, who's, the, the, the thing that ALF does that, that some places don't do in, in, in terms of, of how we can use social networks is that even if a comedy club has a, a Twitter account or a Twitter name, who the hell is going to follow that? It, it, so if you don't have somebody you know, representing you, like even Delta, you know, within minutes, had Delta Assist you know, contacting him, was clearly a person. That you, you have to be vigilant about putting stuff out in the world that people are interested in, and not just promotion, like Campbell said. And you know, Alfred brought a lot of personality to to the comedy store through you know maintaining a relationship with the audience. Whereas a lot of businesses, yeah, I mean, really, who, who's going to follow a business? Yeah. And, and like, I, I tweeted something about Starbucks this morning, and I, and I because they're probably shitty. And 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 I you know and I used their, their their Twitter name and I went to their site and they got a million and a half followers. And I'm like, who, who's really really saying every day going like, did you see what Starbucks tweeted? I mean, is it really <laughs> I had a great experience. Just for some reason, Twitter was recommending that I follow Panera Bread. <laughs> <laughs> And a lot of their Twitter feed was just responding to individual complaints. <laughs> so you were only seeing one side. Um, so sorry your experience with us was so disappointing. <laughs> and I just retweeted about 30 of <laughs> And it was cracking myself up for like hours. And it was that same thing of my, uh, my followers going, please stop doing this, you douchebag. But it was funny. Thing. However, 
when you have a couple hundred comedians live tweeting it uh, in real time, it becomes a really funny, engaging, interactive experience, and in a weird way, educational. You're actually paying attention to what's going on. That, and, and, and we find that, that those events, um, the Oscars, Save the Union, any sort of big national live event, our traffic goes through the roof as we're live tweeting these things. And, and again, it's, it's cross-promotional. It's good for us as comedians, and it's good for us as a company. It works great to yes, uh, be funny. If you are funny, if your content is good, uh, people will find it, comedians in particular will find it and support you. And they, they need you to retweet them, though. Yes. That's we all need you to yes. I mean, you know, that, I mean, yeah, that's all well and good that people are funny and people will find them. But the interesting thing is about the emperors of Twitter, of which Michael is one, is that, <laughs> you, you know, in order for people to get any traction, they need to be, sadly, you know, coordinated by somebody that has a huge fan base. And, and I would like to note that that sort of interaction has dropped off significantly from the early days of Twitter. We used to get a lot more support from the uh, from the comics uh, until uh, until you know the comics numbers. Obviously, because a person is more interesting uh, to follow than a business, the comics numbers started getting much much bigger than the uh, than the ones that the comedy store would have. And so you find a, a real disconnect. The the, uh, the comics who need the numbers that the comedy store can provide will consistently be supported, but those who have moved past that are no longer so interested. And it's, it's, it's been an interesting thing to watch. This is correct for us. It is. I think, it <laughs> absolutely is. The, uh, going back to what you were saying, Mark, the, the difference with MySpace and Facebook and Twitter is that, you know, MySpace comedy was, it was editorial driven. You know, I, I've been comedy for a long time, and, and so I've been around a lot of these guys, and I've seen a lot of people, and, you know, we're able to give a voice behind who we think is really growing, MySpace because we were pushing that. Yeah. You're not getting that on Facebook, you're not getting that on Twitter. Maybe a little bit of it on Twitter by putting it on the front page, but overall we, we were strictly editorial driven and trying to build out people's careers. And the amazing thing is that that Dan Cook thing, that like just no matter what you think of him, the whole idea of maintaining personal contact with your fans in a compulsive way. You know, not, you know, not only as a business thing, but also as you know, just a, a, you know, an entertainer's need, um, was one of the most helpful things I ever saw in my life. And I fought it for a long time. But with social networking, you can really have uh, an intimacy with your, with your fans, with people that care about what you're doing. And it, it's rewarding for everybody, and, and it, it, it's very effective. And if you're an upcoming comedian, and you really, really do, you're, in, you're interacting with somebody like Mark, or you're trying to develop a following, have a really, really strong point of view. Find out what your voice is, and contact those publications. They're all on Twitter and Facebook as well. Contact them, let them know how to follow you, and give them clips. But the important thing is, is uh, I don't believe in luck. Somebody said, I, I forget what, who it was, and it's attributed to several people, Theodore Roosevelt and amongst others, but the harder I work, the luckier I get. If you are ready to uh, put yourself, work really, really hard at getting your uh, comedy in a position to where you can get a nice five minute clip, get the video clip, have it ready to send out, have a nice high res image that's easily accessible and it's easily mailable on a free uh, site like Flickr, where you can mail the high res image to a press contact. If you're in this position to accept this lucky bounce, and the New York Times decides, you know what, we're gonna do a, a feature on up and coming comedians. Do you have a five minute set that I can look at? You have to have a five minute set or your fucking opportunity is gone, poof. And you're gonna be like, gosh, I'm, I'm never lucky. Patrice O'Neill gets all the lucky breaks. <laughs> but, and, that was not the right word. <laughs> 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 They put themselves in a position to accept the lucky bounce. They had their clip ready. They had a clean audio clip that they can send to the radio station whenever the radio station wants to play some new young comedian. They start this, uh, the New York Times wants to quote you, and you don't have a website. You don't need it necessarily CambryCruise.com, but now, thankfully, for things like uh, MySpace and Facebook, you don't need that. You just need a place for somebody to go, find your bio, get a high-res image, get your clip. So put yourself in a position to accept the lucky chance by working hard. Yeah, sometimes there, there is luck involved with that. And, and, and I don't, you know, want to, I'm not, you know, too good about horn, but just like there was, because all this stuff is fairly fascinating to me. I, I, and I am, for most practical purposes, not, not a, a, a techie at all. I, I barely know how to do what it is that I'm doing. Um, 
But there was an interesting confluence of events that happened around the bump with, with WTF, which was that, for reasons completely out of my control, you know, Rolling Stone, you know, plugged it. And then, you know, the Times did do a piece on me, and I had no idea that these were all happening, you know, at, you know, at the same time. But because all these things came together, and I had the social network and the advent of it, and I also was able to, uh, to, to kind of capitalize on that. It, it made a tremendous difference to, to bring events to the show. But a lot of those things were out of my control, but I think you're right. Yeah, but so you were working hard, you were ready for it. Kind of like he was, uh, <laughs> Michael had said that he had started Twitter, and before Twitter really took off, that's lucky, except that he had already been working hard at it. He was ready to accept it. And whenever I got, uh, I started blogging in the early days of blogging, and they just started doing all these round up meetup groups and articles on who are the popular bloggers. I had been blogging on GeoCities before Blogger even was invented. So I was ready, and when they started asking who are the popular bloggers, I would already had a following because I had been doing it and was interacting, I was uh, yeah. doing all those social media type things. I replying to comments, going to the meetup groups, having a card ready, just free business cards or whatever with my URL on it. So yeah, you, it is, it's a timing issue, I wouldn't say. And also it's issue. great to be able to spend five hours on a plane just manically ranting about bullshit <laughs> and, and say like, you know, this part of my job. Well, if you're young, you have to make the time. If you want to make it happen, you do have to make the time. You have to sacrifice sleep, no, part of the going job. out and partying and relationships and that kind of thing. You absolutely do make sacrifices. I, I'd like to take a, a moment though to, to sort of contextualize all of this. Um, what, we're, what we're looking at though is, is, um, is a bunch of people here who, who uh, comedy as a art form went through a major change with the help of social media. And what happened was, instead of the, the power being solely in the hands of, of gatekeepers and power brokers, uh, that was sort of democratized. And it was put more in the hands of, of the artists themselves. Uh, we saw that specifically in comedy clubs. And, and where do comedy clubs fit within that context has been a, a very difficult journey for, for us. Uh, but all of this is relatively new, and I think what's amazing about it is that comedy was very well situated overall to be in this position. Uh, we're talking about a lot of people with a lot of opinions, and we're talking about and a lot of free time. time. Sorry? And a lot of free time. Right, and a lot of free time, and, and platforms that are conducive to quips and, and quirky uh, 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 comments. Or whatever, Mike. Right, and so, and so at, at the end of the day, <laughs> what we find is the entire art form and the entire uh, industry of comedy transformed uh, with the help of social media. And, and now the, it, it, we have a very rare instance where uh, the artists have a lot of control over the, uh, over the, uh, the art form. I, I think, personally, I think it's wonderful. It's forced, uh, it's forced comedy clubs, for example, to re-examine exactly what it is we do. And what is it that we do? Well, so I think, Right, so drinks, and, 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 and beyond that, we are uh, uh, re-emphasizing the fact that we, we create comics, that, that we do have a system in that, that we do have comics which devote themselves to our specific club, and elevating their careers and trying to help them out has become uh, not, a, not a new thing, but, but more, uh, more centralized to our, uh, to our goals and to what we do. And I think it's very positive. And what you're looking at here is a community that was very close-knit, but you didn't know about it. Now you know how close-knit it is. And because uh, comedy is such a close-knit community that was in that specific time and place, ready to take advantage of social media, uh, it's been elevated as an art form to the extent now that when you think of the internet, you think porn, you think news, you think music, and you think ha-ha funny. And I think that's, that's an amazing power and, and really, uh, exactly. really order a positive thing. Well, no, <laughs> I, I think um, you know something about uh, social media is that you need to be 